Okay. So it is uh, 1032. We're going to switch over to our financial planning topic. I hope that was helpful. I know, I, I again, I know these analyst reports can be conflicting, and that's what I like to share with you because I, I, I want to look for different opinions. Um, and these are some of the brightest thinkers out there, and they, they really – don't agree with how things are going. And the reason I share with that is to give you some background and, and so you can make smart investment decisions and if your client, so you understand where we're coming from. But, um, uh, you know, it, it all comes down to nobody really knows, of course. So how do you guard yourself against significant losses in the markets, but have the ability to take advantage of growth? And uh, you know my theory, you know, we, we've got to start with strong asset allocation, good components of your investment models, Principal protection is vital um, and uh, account segmentation where you divide up your your accounts so that they're specifically funding each each time of your life. If you're in retirement, if you're nearing retirement, you treat things a little differently. But um, that's uh, that's really how you um, you manage this. And you want to be defensively optimistic. You, we want to be optimistic about the growth of our our nation and the world. But we um, we have to be defensive, whether you're, again, just coming into retirement or um, that you're a few years or many years into retirement, you, you don't have a lot of room for mistakes. You younger folks out there, of course, you can still make mistakes, but there's no need to, right? You can, you, you know, you, you don't want to be haphazard about it. Okay. I hope that's helpful. All right. Let's switch over to our financial planning topic. So let me just get my board together. And I promise you, I will try to stay within my time. Okay, so here we are. I'm hoping that you can see my whiteboard, and this is the um, the financial 15. And today we're going to talk about investment indices. And if you're just joining us for this section um, on YouTube, I'm going to ask you to hit the subscribe, like, and notification button so that you're always on top of what we have going on. Um, okay, so this is what I was talking about. So, if, and again, if you're just uh, joining us, what you did miss was, um, you know, about a half an hour of our. A weekly webinar, and I, I read some updates about IRA distributions and some things to watch out for. And I talk about the markets, what happened last week, and I read, read and share my thoughts on some analyst reports. And this financial 15 is the last 15 minutes or so, sometimes more, of uh, of that webinar. And so if you want to go back and find that webinar, you can do that. And, uh, and But let's dive into this. So this is the, the, the chart I shared with you uh, a couple weeks ago. And this is kind of what inspired me to have this discussion about indices. So I'm not going to go uh, into this uh, chart here, but um, it really came down to the fact that the performance, uh, let's see, at this point, uh, it doesn't give the total performance, but um, the we just reported that the S&P 500 was up over 5, 4%, or excuse me, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, as of Friday was up uh, four over 4%, and the S&P 500 was up over 15%. So it really, um, someone said, well, you know, what's the difference? Why, why is it? I mean, that's a big difference. 11% is a big difference. And you can see that it has to do with how the indices are weighted and what's driving those um, those indices. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. And again, as always, a lot of information you'll see. Uh, I'm just going to zoom out so you can see all the information on the board here that I want to go over as quickly as possible. So uh, so stay with me. So we're going to first focus on the S&P 500 here. And I got to make sure I'm not covering things up. So the S&P 500 was launched in 1923 with just 233 companies. So it was two different companies. I forget exactly what they were called, but they came together. Um, I think in 1941 to, to form uh, Standard & Poor's. It's market cap rated, weighted. So what does that mean? So let's pull over here and I'll share with you what market cap weighting is. So now I love these little um, uh, snippets and this isn't something I wrote. It's something I researched and pulled in for you, but it's from investopedia.com. And I like to use things that you can go out and find yourself. And I have to tell you, I get an email from investopedia.com every morning that gives me a financial term. And uh, I love that. I just, you know, sometimes uh, yesterday it was, it was a term called kurtosis. And it's something I knew very, very well when I, um, when I sat for my CFP exam, but something I don't talk about every day. So it's always nice to, to um, be reminded of these things. So market cap, what, what is market cap waiting? Market capitalization. I'm right here. I'm trying to be mindful not to cover up my, uh, 
content with my picture. Market capitalization refers to how much a company is worth as determined by the stock market. It is defined as the total market value of all outstanding shares. To calculate a company's market cap, multiply the number of outstanding shares by the current market value of one share. Um, these should be tradable shares. Uh, that are in the market, not not to restrict shares or um, you know uh, things that aren't um, traded in the open markets. Companies are typically divided according to market capitalization. Large cap you'll hear are large companies are ten billion dollars or more. Mid cap is two billion to ten billion, and small cap or small companies is three hundred million to two billion. Market cap is often used to determine a company's size and evaluate the company's financial performance to other companies of various sizes. In investing, companies with larger market capitalizations are often safer investments uh, as they represent more established companies with generally longer history in business. You can't you, you just disregard that, right? Be, um, that's not my recommendation. That's something that came off of, um, of Investopedia because there are uh, there have been some changes. Let's see. This might be a good seg segue. Yes. Um, so remember that just said that these are typically more uh, established companies, with longer histories and safer investments. But here's where, where they may not be safe because they're a component of the S&P 500. So read this with me. Beginning here, the S&P 500's most recent rebalancing was announced on March 10th, 2023 and took effect before markets opened on March 15th, 2023. SVB Financial Group was removed from the S&P 500 index due to the failure of its bank, Silicon Valley Bank. The Federal Deposit uh, uh, Insurance Corporation took the group into receivership, making it ineligible for inclusion into the index. It was replaced with Insulate uh, Corp. Uh, similarly, on the same date, Signature Bank was taken into FDIC receivership and was removed from the index and placed replaced with, I guess that's Bungie, Limited. Um, the uh, so that's important. So don't look at that and say, okay, I'm just going to invest in the S&P 500 because they're safer investments because that's not the case. Oops, I didn't mean to move that. All right, let's pull back over here to my list. Whoa. So that was market cap weighted. I hope you understand a little bit now about what market cap is. Returns mostly driven by the top weighted companies. So let's see. I think I have this over here. Whoops. Oh, here's a, let's talk about this. This is the example of an S&P 500 market cap weighting. That's right. Um, all right, here's Apple. In order to understand how the underlying, whoops, you can't, I see I'm cutting myself off. All right, in order to understand how the underlying stocks affect the S&P 500, the individual market weights must be calculated by dividing the market cap of each company by the total market cap of the index. Below is an example of Apple's weighting. Now we're talking about the weighting of the, um, the company versus the index. So Apple reported 15.94 billion shares outstanding in its February 2023 annual re annual filing for the quarter ending December 31st, 2022, and had a stock price of, uh, I'm right here, just so you're following me, of uh, $183.96 at the end of the trading day on June 21st, 2023. Apple's market cap is $2.8. Uh, 9 trillion as of June 21st. The S&P 500 total market cap is approximately 36.79 trillion as of May 31st, which is the sum of the market caps for all stocks in the index. Therefore, Apple's weighting in the index was approximately 7.85% or 2.89 trillion divided by 36.7 trillion. Overall, the larger the market weight of a company, the more impact each 1% change and stock price will have an index. Don't pay attention to that. That was going into the next paragraph. So I hope you understand now how what market cap is and how they're weighted. Now, let's see. I do have uh, a list of the companies. Here we go. So here are the, the um, top 25 uh, companies in the S&P 500. So let me just see how I can fit this in. We're not going to be able to fit them all in. And the weightings next to them. So we just heard about seven companies driving the NASDAQ. L let's look at the top seven companies in the S&P 500. Um, they're the exact same companies. Uh, and But if you add, you have to add Alphabet on here. Oh, the Class C. That's why the S&P 500 has five. Actually, the S&P 500, I have a note on there, 503 companies because different share class. We have Alphabet Class A and we have Alphabet Class C. 
but the same seven companies um, are driving the majority of the returns of the S&P 500 as they are the NASDAQ. And you'll see more about that later. But these are the top 25 companies in the S&P 500 by weight. Hope that makes sense. I'm just checking to see if you can see it. Okay. You know, I'm going to move this so I can put this down. Let's see. I'm just going to move my tablet down so I can draw on this better. And we talked about, so we talked about mar uh, market cap weighting, that the returns are mostly driven by the top weighted companies. We talked about how that weighting works, right, with the, with the example of, um, of Apple. And 503 companies due to share classes, I showed you that. So Apple Al Alphabet is actually um, shown in the top eight twice because of the uh, share class C and share class A. Uh, institutional investors perceive the S&P 500 as more representative of U.S. equity markets because it comprises more stocks across all sectors, 500 versus Dow's 30. That's a fair statement. Um, so now let's talk about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average, um, it represents 30 U.S. company compared to 500. It's price weighted, and we're going to talk about what that is in a moment. And it, it was created in 1896 by a fellow named Charles Dow. <laughs> um, so let's slide over here and see what uh, what makes up the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, and I've got two lists of companies uh, for this. So understanding the Dow Jones, fixing that. Understanding the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is the second oldest market index after the Dow Jones Transportation Average. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was designed to serve as a proxy for the health of the broader U.S. economy, often referred to simply as the Dow. It is one of the most watched stock market indices in the uh, indexes in the world. While the Dow includes a range of companies, all of them can be described as blue chip companies with consistently stable earnings. I think that's fair. Doesn't mean safe or any of that. Um, but it uh, it does uh, it's a fair statement. So these are alphabetical, and that's the order they're in. We have 3M, American Express, Amgen. I'll just let you read them, and if you need to go back and look, you can. But these are the Dow 30. As of July 2023, this this month. Now that's how they're listed alphabetically. Let's see the top 10 weightings. So we have uh, United Health, Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, Home Depot, McDonald's, Caterpillar, Visa, Amgen, Boeing, Salesforce. Much different than what we see uh, in the S&P 500. And you're going to see the comparison to the NASDAQ in a moment. So I hope that's clear. I don't see any questions. You guys are quiet today. All right. Now that's the Dow. Let's see if there's anything else here. I hope the zooming in and out isn't too confusing or bothersome, but uh, it, it, it helps me, you know, it's good with, uh, with all this information. All right, so I struggled with this. We're going to just talk about the NASDAQ composite a bit. And we're also going to talk about the NASDAQ 100. So just for my own use, this... Uh, this index is probably what's quoted the most, although I could be wrong. But this seems to be what I hear the most, NASDAQ 100. So I want to include both because they are different. So the NASDAQ composite was um, was uh, began in 1971. It is market cap weighted also. It can be non-US companies. That's a big difference. And there's more than 3,000 companies represented in the NASDAQ composite. So I don't think I have a, a, a listing of all those companies, but I do have the NASDAQ 100. Now, NASDAQ 100 was created in 1985. It has a, it uses a modified market cap weighting. There are no financials in the NASDAQ 100. It can be non-U.S. companies. And of course, it's 100 companies and it's actually 103. Now, let's look at, that's the, uh, let's look at what's in the top, or the, yeah, the top 10 companies in NASDAQ 100. So, Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, Tesla, Meta, right? That's Facebook. Alphabet class A and, a and C. Uh, and then that leaves Broadcom and Pepsi. So 
if I if I went up and I grabbed the top ten in the S and P five hundred, it's it's going to be the same, right? Um, just different weightings because of how they how they weight their holdings. The but I I'm willing to bet that would be pretty close as well. So the again, you've got seven different companies um, driving most of the returns, certainly in this in this index, and certainly in the S and P five hundred as well. So um, how do we compare? investment platforms that are broadly based against an index that's returning most of the returns um, against, uh, or, you know, with, with seven or eight holdings, if eight, if you include Apple, um, Google class C, and again, alphabet is uh, Google. Because that's the issue. If you had a portfolio of just these seven companies, you would not, you would likely not feel diversified. But we're kind of demanding that from investment managers, and we we compare them to these indices to 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 compare their performance. And the question I have going into um, this year, seeing what we've returned, is, and I've asked this before, is that fair? Um, and the thing is, is that while we compare investment performance of individual managers, whether they're mutual funds or uh, or actively ma managed um, outside money managers, um, we wouldn't accept a portfolio that is just held with seven, um, seven stocks. So is it fair to compare the performance of those managers who have a broader um, direction other than just beat the index against the S&P 500 or um, the NASDAQ, because what, what the heck am I talking about? I'm sharing with you a Morningstar report for a very, um, a, a typical mutual fund. So you'll see that I X'd out the name because I didn't want this to see, to be, to be viewed as a recommendation to own or not own this fund. So let me make sure you can see what's going on here. And you'll see here, I circled it a little bit, or I, I covered it up with my circle. Uh, this thing sticks sometimes when I do that. It'll it'll come back in a second. But um, the uh, I hope it does anyway. Sometimes when I use the eraser portion of this uh, pen, this happens, and I I I own no better. Yeah, there's there's all my squiggles. So let me just back those out. All right, let's try this a little differently. Let's use this eraser eraser. Okay, what I the reason I went through that, what I wanted you to see here was the index that we're comparing this to. So we have the Russell 1000. Listen, I talked about the S&P 500, the Dow, and the NASDAQ. There are, I don't know how many other index indices or indexes, however you want to say it, but um, the uh, there's a lot. So I just chose the most common. So benchmark one on this is the Russell 1000. Um, obviously, the top 1,000 companies um, in uh, the U.S., uh, and uh, the second benchmark is the Standard & Poor's 500 or the S&P 500. So let's. what am I talking about? So here's the return on um, this year. So as of May 2023, I'm over here. So let's give, let's give some direction here. I'm over here. Uh, so May 2023, the net asset value, that's the price of the, um, of the mutual fund. Uh, is 3583. The total return year to date as of 523 was 6.38%. So what does this mean? Plus or minus benchmark. So that, that means comparing it to the Russell 1000, this fund underperformed that benchmark by negative 14.37%. So what we'd want to do is go back to that Russell 1000, see what the makeup is of that Russell 1000, just like I showed you with the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. But most importantly, see what the hold, the top holdings that are not necessarily, I guess it would work out, the top, uh, top 10 holdings, um, but certainly the top weighted holdings and what's driving the return of that index. And is it fair to con compare it against a broad-based uh, mutual fund that is supposed to invest in large company. These style boxes up here show us that this fund does go and switches a little bit, but right now it's kind of in between um, large company growth and large company value, and it's right in the middle. Um, so it's it's you know it's its direction should be a little differently than just chasing the top seven stocks within an index. 
But you might look at this and say, oh, wow, this this fund stinks so far this year. We're paying a fee, and this fee on this fund is um, one half of 1%, I think it is. We can find that in a moment. Um, but um, uh, you could say this is underperforming, and maybe we should get rid of it. And that might be a fair assessment, but I would say it's probably a little unfair. And again, that's not why – that's one of the reasons I'm not sharing the name of the of – the, um, the company or the the mutual fund with you because I don't want this to be seen as a recommendation, just an illustration of how an, a proper evaluation might be applied to um, an index, uh, an index versus a uh, an actively managed portfolio. But you see, last year, if we're using the same metric, right, beat the this this fund beat the so that was a negative year. All right, so this shows the markets were down. This shows here the markets are up. That was a negative year last year, and the return was negative 14% of the fund, but it outperformed the Russell 1000 by 14%, so lost just about half, and outperformed the S&P 500 by 3.76 or 3. Point, yeah, 3.76%. So you've got to look at um, is there a history of underperformance? Is underperformed here, underperform here, underperform here. So if you look back, and, and I would say that this is probably um, just a broad brush, I would raise concerns about this investment because it has a history of underperforming the, um, the indices that it's, that it's tied to. However, like I said, I wouldn't throw it out necessarily just for this year or for significant up years um, because of the concentration in the indices. Now, let's see. If we can find out what the I'm looking for the expense ratio here. Let's see. That's that's the cost on the on the fund here. So it looks like 0.55% is what the costs are of this fund. So you gotta ask yourself, and this is the answer in that question, how do we use these indices to to um to compare them or research investments, you got to ask yourself, is the savings of, um, let's make this clear. For example, last year is the fact that you lost less in 2022 by 14.78% compared to the, um, the Russell 1000 and three by 3.7% compared to, um, the S and P 500. Is that worth the 0.55%? And then you also have to, you can't look at that in a vacuum. You have to compare it to every other uh, return. And that's just looking at returns. You should also be considering the philosophy of the investment manager, their um, their team and how long their team's been together. And do they have key people that are looking at potentially leaving? You know, there's, there's a lot more to it. I just want to share to you, with you today how we use indices to compare to investments. So, okay, we've covered a lot, folks. Let's just zoom out here and see everything. Make sure we've covered everything. Um, we didn't talk about, uh, did we talk about price weighting? I don't think we talked about price weighting for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I apologize. No. Um, so let's just go back for a second for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Because remember, this is price weighted compared to the S&P 500, which is market cap weighted. So price weighting. So let's uh, let's look at this. In a price weighted stock index, each company stock is weighted by its price per share, and the index is an average of the share prices of all the companies. Price weighted indices uh, give greater weight to stocks with higher prices in terms of their contribution to the index value and changes in the index. A price weighted index can be used to track the average stock price of a, of a given market or industry. All right, so I hope that makes sense. That's that is different, and I think we covered everything else. Everything else looks like it. Yes. So let me go back here. Find my stinking. I have to go back up here. Okay. That's me. All right. So um, I hope that was helpful. It is uh, 1056. See, a little longer than 15 minutes, but we'll, we'll start breaking these up. Um, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Yes, there will be a webinar next week. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at questions at outerboroughwealth.com. Oh, let me see. Hold on. Maybe this is a good. There you go. Uh, questions at outerboroughwealth.com uh, or um, look at that. And I even have questions. So you can reach out to us at questions at outerboroughwealth.com if you have questions or if you want to uh, schedule time with me. If you're if you're a client, you can use the link that's on our website just for clients, just for you. Um, if uh, There's also a link to the website 
uh, for uh, folks who want to explore being clients of ours, or you can reach out, out to us again at questions at outofourwealth.com. And uh, I hope that was helpful and we'll see you all next week. And I think next week I'm going to do an overview of our new website, but we'll see when we get there. Have a great week, everybody. Take care.